cabalgando, cabalgando con río y valor, va cantando las tristes historias de una guerra que ya terminó. Mine were of trouble. Prologue. It is hard now to recall the atmosphere of 1936. When I had came down from Cambridge in June of that year, the pattern of European politics was confused and obscure. The foundations of peace seemed in danger of collapse. But as yet, few were convinced that another world war was inevitable, or could foresee the alignment of the powers if it should happen. The bewilderment of the peoples of Europe was reflected in the mistakes and hesitations of their rulers. Hitler had achieved supreme power in Germany, but the full horrors and dangers of his rule were not universally apparent. Indeed, he was often applauded in Germany and outside for cleaning up the mess of the Weimar Republic and for his suppression of communism. But the recreation of the Wehrmacht, Germany's withdrawal from the League of Nations and her military occupation in the Rhineland, gave warning of what was to come. In a France weakened by succession of short-lived and ineffective governments, and resentful, that victory in 1918 had brought neither security nor stability. The German occupation of the Rhineland induced a shock of indignation and protest. Monsieur Flandin, taken by surprise, was unable to act with the necessary decision. Having approached the British government for assurances that Britain would support French military action, against the German coup, and being unable to attain them, he acquiesced in a situation which all Frenchmen deplored, and of which were most terrified. The national disapproval was reflected in the subsequent elections, which returned to power a front popular government, under the nominal leadership of Monsieur Leon Blum, but with powerful, though less obvious, communist affiliations. The national unity, welded by German action, was succeeded by danger and disintegration, by strikes and mass demonstrations in which supporters of the Front Populaire clashed blood, blood, uh, bloodily with ancient combatants, Action Francaise and Croix de Faux. The general opinion in England was that the French are at loggerheads. The Italian people, elated by their success in Abyssinia, in the face of the British and French opposition, were embittered rather than discouraged by the policy of the sanctions. They became progressively and aggressively anti-British and increasingly truculent towards their French and Balkan neighbors. The Axis was being forged. In southeastern Europe, Yugoslavia, plunged into crisis two years earlier by the murder of King Alexander, was continually disturbed by further Ustashi in IMRO activities. The former were fomented by Italy, the latter by Bulgaria. Throughout the country of Croats, Macedonians, and Muslims were reacting against the dominance of Serbia. Albania was ruled by King Ahmed Zogu with Italian financial and economic aid. In October of 1935, King George of Greece had been restored to his throne by a pleb, pleb, uh, plebiscite of his people. Russian policy had radically altered, had been radically altered by two important events a couple of years earlier. In internal affairs, the murder of Kirov in Leningrad on the December 1st, 1934, put an end to all hopes that Stalin might follow a more liberal policy. There ensued a merciless repression. Beginning with the trial and execution of Zinoviev, Zino, Zinoviev and Kamenev and culminating in the virtual elimination of the Bolshevik Old Guard in the Great Purges of 1936 through 1938. In the words of Greta Garbo in the film uh, Ninotka, there would be fewer and better Russians. The other event, which had a vital effect on Soviet foreign policy and on the communist activity throughout Europe, was the inauguration uh, at the 7th Congress of 
Comintern in 1934, of the doctrine of the popular front. In the future, communists abroad were to combine with all parties, socialist, liberal, radical, and even conservative, who would join them in popular fronts for peace and against fascism. The control of the various popular fronts was to be in the firm but unobtrusive hands of the communists. Within the next two years, popular front governments were established in France and Spain. The Spanish monarchy had fallen five years before in April 1931, when King Alfonso um, was it, 13, went into voluntary exile to avoid the risk of civil war. Shortly afterwards, Don Niceto Acala Zamora became president of the Spanish Republic, with Don Manuel uh, Azana as prime minister. Socialist government controlled the country for the next two years. Its rule was interrupted briefly by an attempted coup d'etat on August 10, 1932, led by General Senhurjo, the Lion of Morocco, which was quickly suppressed. The general had commanded the Guardia Civil in 1931, and by his defeatist attitude had precipitated the departure of King Alfonso. Now he declared uh, now he declared for the king, but was captured and sentenced to death. Uh, reprieved at the last moment by Anzana, and sent to prison in Spanish West Africa. In 1933, the socialist government was superseded by a coalition of far right-wing parties under the leadership of Senor uh, Gil Robles. In 1934, the parties of the left attempted armed revolution, which broke into civil war in the Austrias among the inflammable miners of that province. After heavy fighting, this revolt was suppressed, the instigators being treated with leniency. The succession of right-wing governments continued until the elections of February 1936, which put a popular front government into power with Senor Cáceres uh, Guiorga as Prime Minister. This government proved unable to control the extremists of the right or the left, and preparations for a civil war on both sides throughout the country. Such was the state of Europe when I came down from Cambridge, not yet 21 years of age, with a degree in classics and law, a restless temperament, no money, in what the Trinity College magazine once described as a deplorable tendency to simper. End of prologue. Chapter 1, Mine Were of Trouble. I remember very well the morning I left London. It was a cold, wet day in November 1936, and in the temple gardens the trees, now bare of their leaves, swayed and dripped sadly in the bleak wind. I had been awake since dawn and had breakfasted lightly. For I was too excited to feel hunger. Now that the one suitcase that was all my luggage stood by the door of the flat, and I took a last look around. In an hour, the charwoman would arrive, and in the evening, the two baristers with whom I shared the flat would return from their chambers. By then, I should be across the channel, on my way to Spain and the Civil War. As I stood at my bedroom window, Looking down the puddles in the king's bench walk, a green sports car with a long bonnet turned the corner by the library and stopped immediately beneath me. The door opened, and the lanky figure of Douglay Hills stepped onto the pavement, making signs for me to hurry down. A year younger than myself and one of my closest friends at Cambridge, he had suggested on hearing of my plans that he should drive me to his new Aston Martin to the boat at New Haven, where I would say goodbye to my mother and father. I turned from the window, took leave of my number two, paper buildings, and carried my luggage down to the waiting car. It had taken me almost a month to make my final decision to go to this war and abandon, at least temporarily, my efforts to become a barista. Even though I had no idea how to carry out my decision, I knew no Spanish, I had never been to Spain, and I did not know anyone on the nationalist side. Of course, if I had been willing to join the international brigade, uh, brigade and fight for the Republicans, it would have been simple. Every other country, there were organizations ably directed by the various communist parties for that very purpose, but the nationalists were making no effort to recruit in England. Luckily, at this point, I received an invitation through a friend to see the Marquise de Morel, 
who occupied a position in the Nationalist Agency in London. Del Moro, an Englishman by birth who had distinguished himself as a young man in South Africa, received me with some reserve. So, you want to go to Spain? Why? To fight, sir. Good. He relaxed a little of his severity. Well now, I can give you a letter to a friend of mine in, uh, Byrates, the Conde de los Andes. He runs a courier service across the frontier, and I dare say he'd send you as far as Burgos. Better not let him know you're going to fight, though. With all this talk of non-intervention, the French authorities wouldn't be so tolerant of his couriers if they thought he was passing through volunteers for our side. Though they don't seem to mind how many go through the Reds, he smiled rather sourly. Can you get a journalist's cover? I suggest a chit from some editor saying you are authorized to send him articles and news. I think I can manage that. But what do I do when I get to Burgos? I'm afraid I can't help you there. You'll have to look after yourself. But it shouldn't be difficult. After all, it is the GHQ. Soon afterwards, I was in the North Cliff House, asking to see my friend Colin Brooks, then editor of the Sunday Dispatch. At that time, Lord Rothmere's newspapers were supporting the Nationalists. An accessible and genial person, Brooks listened attentively while I told him of my project and of my conversation with Del Moro. Boy, he said, beaming at me through the thick lens of his glasses. There's anything from 50 to 500 pounds in this. Good luck to you and send us anything you can. When I left his office, I carried a piece of paper signed by him, which read as far as I can remember, to whom it may concern, Mr. Peter Kempt is authorized to collect news and transmit articles for the Sunday dispatch from the Spanish fronts of war. We were silent in the car as the car splashed through the suburbs. I was going over in my mind the events of the past fortnight. Everything seemed to have happened so quickly since I had made my decision and written in some trepidation to tell my father. A retired justice chief, or a retired chief justice of the Bombay High Court. He disapproved, I knew, of many aspects of my life at Cambridge and in London. He had visions of my rowing in the university boat and getting a double first in the classics and law. And he was justly disappointed when I gave up rowing after my first year and barely achieved an honors degree at the end of my third. I was surprised, therefore, by his generous reaction to my letter. He came to see me in London announced that he had told his bank to open a monthly credit for me in Burgos, gave me a great deal of sound advice, and finally took me on a tour of the army and the navy stores. To see you get the right equipment for this sort of thing. I have no idea what equipment we brought, but I remember a bulky medicine chest which seemed to contain chiefly iodine, quinine, and cascara, which I lost within a month of my arrival in Spain. I also bought Hugo's Spanish in three months without a master. I rejected my father's offer of his 275 sporting man lyncher carbine as being likely to cause trouble with customs. The ensuing days I spent in a state of joyful excitement and in the preparations for my journey. One incident only remains in my memory. I was having tea with a friend in her house. We had often discussed the idea of my going to Spain and now with my departure imminent, I suppose I had acquired a certain glamour in her eyes. After a while, her father came into the room, an old professional so soldier, now retired with a distinguished record in the Great War and several lesser wars before it. Daddy, she shouted, for he had become very deaf. Peter Kemp is going off to Spain. Spain, the old gentleman roared back. Spain, what's he want to go to Spain for? He's going to fight in the war, Daddy. What? The colonel turned on me. You're going to Spain to fight? Yes, sir. You damned fool. You know what fighting means. It's hell. You bloody young idiot. Ever read Napier's Peninsula War? I hadn't. You damned well read it. Icicles hanging from their noses. Icicles. Frostbite. Hunger. It's hell, I tell you. You make me sick. We passed through East Grinstead and left the traffic behind. The wind tore across the bonnet in great gusts from the southwest, slapping viciously at the side curtains while the rain beat in a fierce deluge on the windscreen. 
exhilarated by the roar of the engine and by our need for haste, Hills urged the car on through the Sussex countryside towards the coast. The vibration of the wheel in his hands, the hiss of the tires on the wet tarmac, and the splash of mud against the wings are all still vivid in my memory. More vivid still is the wild moment when he took a sharp curve at close on 80, skidded sideways towards a telegraph pole in a ditch and strained out, apparently without effort, on the rim of disaster. I was nervous on corners since the night, and a few months previously and shortly before my triple examinations, when I had failed to take a double bend at Melbourne, just outside Cambridge and run a speed six Bentley through a wire fence and a concrete wall into the telegraph pole, damaging myself only slightly, but dislocating the telegraph and telephonic communications between Lenick, uh, London and Cambridge for 24 hours. Dear Peter, began the type the typewritten letter from my father a week later. This deplorable termination of your career at Cambridge. Sometimes, he concluded, I think that God must have made you for a bet. Peter, said Hill suddenly, what the devil is this really in aid of? Meaning what? Well, I know at the moment, well, all I know at the moment is that you're going to Spain, that you're going there to fight, and that you're going to fight against the government, or the Reds, or whatever you call them. Just why are you going? And why particularly do you choose to fight for the insurgents? Or don't you really mind which side you fight for? Certainly, I answered tartly. I mind very much which side I fight for. Nothing in the world would induce me to join the other side. Moreover, I added pompously, you know the interests I took in politics at Cambridge. Yes, I remember you were too conservative for the Conservative Association. So you formed a splinter union of, our, of your own, he grinned. I don't care about politics myself. We've had too many politicians in the family. Still, if you hold strong political views, I dare say it's quite a good idea to go and fight for them. My reasons aren't entirely political, in fact. I think the political motive is about the least important, except that it determined what side I choose. You see, quite frankly, this war is broken out at a particularly opportune moment for me. I finished my time at Cambridge and taken my degree, but I haven't started on a career, and I still have some months to play with before I commit myself irrevocably to a job that will tie me down for the rest of my life. This war isn't likely to last more than six months. It's a splendid chance for me to go out on my own, to see a strange country and to get to know its language and people, also to learn something about modern warfare. God knows that's likely to be useful enough. Above all, it's a chance to learn to look after myself in difficulty and danger. Up till now, I've never really had to do anything for myself. I mean, I've always known where my next meal was coming from and that, provided I look both ways before crossing the street, I'm not likely to be in any danger. But there's another thing just as important. If you've read the news reports published at the beginning of this war before the imposition of censorship... You'll know that there were appalling scenes of mob violence throughout government territory, wherever the Reds took control. Priests and nuns were shot simply because they were priests or nuns. Ordinary people murdered just because they had a little money or property. It is to fight against that sort of thing that I am going to Spain. I stopped for a breath after this recital. Reviewing them now, I find my words embarrassingly naive. Perhaps I was really trying to justify my decision to myself to convince myself for the last time that it was the right one. On that stormy November morning, I did not know what most of us have learned since, that you do not go to practice, you do not practice to go to war for only a few months, that it is much easier to get into a war than out of it. At least, I finished. The experience is bound to be useful. In any way, I've got nothing to lose. You must have done that drive in almost record time, but when we reached New Haven, we found that we had hurried for nothing. Owing to the gale, the day service had been cancelled, and I had to wait until the evening for a boat. I found my mother and father by the jetty. They had driven from Cooden to see me off, but wisely decided to say goodbye, then and there, rather than to wait around the whole day. We hated, we all hated prolonged leave-takings. The forced cheerfulness the trivial matter and embarrassed silences with the tension mounting by hour and hour. 
I realized that what for me was a gay adventure meant for them the start of a long period of separation and anxiety. I was deeply moved by the way they were ta uh, taking everything. By my mother's cheerful and uncomplaining courage, and my father's generous acceptance of a plan which must have appeared to him to be crazy. When we had said a spirited farewell, standing beside their car on the front, and raising our voices above the wind and sea, I started to walk towards the hotel where I had left Hills. I once, I turned once to look back at them. I still remember my father's broad figure in a dripping Macintosh and old fisherman's hat, standing by the ocean, by the open door of the car, his stern, sad gazing, his stern, sad face gazing intently after me. I never saw him after, after that. To pass the time, Hill suggested a visit to our friends, David and Anthony Holland, who lived nearby at Balcom. Although impatient to start my journey, I, lin I lingered gratefully by the fire in the bright, comfortable drawing room, savoring, as I then felt for the last time, the cozy warmth of an English country house and the cheery hospitality of my friends. Truly, one is never so drawn to England and things English as at moments of departure and return. As we were leaving, their father said to me, Here, I would like to give you this. He took something from his pocket. It was a small black idol, about four inches long, roughly carved in wood and worn smooth and shiny with age, in frequent handling. The face had an expression of an unusual benevolence and charm. I bought him in the Congo a few years ago. He's a lucky fellow. Keep him in your pocket. Thereafter, I always kept him in my pocket wherever I went, until the day, two and a half years later, when I was carried to the hospital on a stretchet, barely conscious and at the gate of death. In the following days of pain and oblivion, he somehow disappeared. The Conde de los Andes, seated at a heavy mahogany desk, desk in his study, was brief and businesslike. I will apply for your uh, salvo conducto today. It will be waiting for you at the Spanish frontier the days after tomorrow. Be here then at half past ten in the morning, and one of my cars will run you to Burgos. I walked out into the sunshine and strolled along the cliffs, delighting in the fresh breeze on my face, in the sight of the long green waves rolling in from the Atlantic and bursting in a foam on the black rocks below me. I pranced with joy as I reveled in the thought of my new freedom and the adventures that lay before me. In this mood of elation, I took the bus to Baymont, or to Bayon, that afternoon, after an excellent lunch and certainly rather too much wine with it. After wandering around town and the port, I went into the cathedral, and there, sitting in the cool, dark silence, I began to reflect on the, event, on the events in Spain which had led to the explosion of civil war. My thoughts raced across the pages of recent Spanish history as I sat with my head in my hands. Slowly a drowsiness overcame me, induced by my tiredness and the wine I had drunk at lunch. When I awoke it was night, and the cathedral was deserted and in darkness, except for a few faint lights by the altar. I made my way to the door where I had entered. It was locked, so too were the other doors I tried. I called out softly at first, as I felt the, in, uh, the impropri impropriety of raising my voice in a cathedral louder afterwards until, in the end, I threw away all restraint and shouted at the top of my voice. After a time, it seemed like ages to me, I heard a shuffling and muttering, and a cross little figure appeared, shaking a large bunch of keys. My French is mediocre, in the best of circumstances, and feeling the fool I did, I was more tongued, or <laughs> tongue-tied than usual. I slammered, uh, Jimmy suis and dormi several times, grinning ingratiatingly, pressed some money into the sacristan's hand and fled. Two days later, at half past ten on a bright clear morning, I rang the bell at the Conde de los Andes Villa. Under a brown teddy bear overcoat, I wore riding breeches, putties, and uh, ammunition boots, relics of my service at the Cambridge University off Officers Training Corps. I carried in my pocket my OTC certificates A and B. 
and which I hoped might give me some prestige in the eyes of the Spanish military authorities. At half past eleven, a large black turning car drew up, driven by a well-dressed man who introduced himself to me in perfect English. As the courier, Señor Pascual Vicuna, when the car had been loaded with my suitcase and a number of briefcases, parcels, and newspapers, I climbed in beside him, and we drove away. We followed the coast, the, the coast road south to St. Jean de Luz and Hende. I sat back happily, admiring the dappled pattern of fields and woods on our left, which rolled away the dark line of pyrenes that stretched eastward in a broken contour ahead of us. As we drove, Vicuna, with great tact and courtesy, questioned me on my reasons for traveling to Spain, but I had resolved to keep strictly to my journalist's cover until we were over the frontier. He had told me he often went to London, where he preferred to stay at Dorchester, although on his last visit he stayed at that new block of flats in Piccadilly, and the Nahum Court. Did I know it? I seemed to remember that he had a son and two daughters at school in England. He was a great admirer of the English and their way of life. It was a pity that, at present, there was so little understanding in England of the nationalist cause. There was so much red propaganda about it. He was convinced that if the British government really understood the issues being fought out in Spain, they wouldn't hesitate to send help to the nationalists. After all, it was really England's battle that was being fought almost as much as Spain's, because if the Reds were to win, of course this was unthinkable. But if they were to win, communism would triumph in Spain. Then France would go communist too. Then where would England be? The Reds had perpetrated appalling crimes in Spain, as I sh should soon find out for myself. This theme, most of, which was, most of which accorded with my own views, was one with I was to hear repeated, repeated constantly and with a rising vehemence by all kinds of classes of Spaniards during the next two and a half years. While we waited at the Hende for the French authorities to stamp our passports and examine the luggage, I stood at the barrier of the International Brigade, gazing across the river uh, Bedosa to the green hills on the Spanish side. Two months earlier, they had been the scene of a storm, uh, a scene of some of the bitterest fighting of the year. When General Mola, Mola's Carlists, after a long and bloody assault, had stormed the dominating fort of San Marcial and secured the key town of, of Uren on the western gateway of the Py, Pyren, Pyren, Pyrenees, a few of the defending forces, Basque Republicans and Austrian miners, escaped westwards to San Sebastian. Once they were evicted nine days later, the remainder, after burning Uron, crossed over into France to be disarmed and interned in squalor and destitution until the outbreak of the Second World War. The International Brigade was their only way out of Spain. Apart from swimming in the Bedosa, the harrowing accounts were received in London of the frightened mass of refugees desperately making their way along it to safety, which I am told inspired some witty, if heartless, young secretary at the foreign office to comment, that's what comes of putting all your Basques in one exit. I could see the square fort on the hill to my left, with the red and gold colors of nationalist Spain floating from its halls, from its walls. <clears throat> the nationalists had paid for their victory with some of their best blood. Gallant and devoted Carlists from Navarre and Al Alava who had railed to the man to Mola's colors on the outbreak of the war. Boys of fifteen and old men of seventy alike rose to defend la fe and la tradición, following in the steps of their ancestors who had fought under uh, Zumala Gargui in the last century. They, with no military training whatever, were taught how to load and fire a rifle as they were brought to the lorry to the front. Then... Or there they were shot down in hundreds on the almost impregnable slopes of San Marcial. Then French officials, after some five minutes' delay, and with no awkward questions, allowed us to proceed. We passed under the barrier and across the International Brigade, alongside the rail where the trains no longer ran. Just beyond the Spanish border, or barrier, we halted. Vicuna went into the control hut to report and to collect my 
uh, Salvo Conducto, while I study at the er, while I studied the crowd of civilians and officials gathered around. There were the civil guard in green uniforms, yellow belts and cross straps, in shiny black tricorn hats, or frontier guards, in lighter green and flat peaked caps, soldiers with the tasseled forage caps and soiled ill-fitting khaki uniforms that were characterized the nationalist army of the peninsula in the civil war many of them loafing about with their round mess tins in their hands and hunks of bread in their mouths civilian officials with brassards and the air of busy authority common to minor functionaries in all countries with some complacency i reflected that my last major obstacle was past now i was in spain it would not be long before I, too, should be wearing a uniform. The great adventure had begun. In my mind, I could already hear the sound of gunfire and bullets whistling past. <clears throat> These ingenious thoughts were shattered by the appearance of a bewildered vicuna, with the news that my salvo conducto had not arrived. I had appalling visions of being returned ignominiously to France to wait until it should turn up and another courier be available to take me. However, after a quarter of an hour of shoulder shrugging, gesticulation, and excited chatter between Vicuna and an officer in charge, I was given another pass, allowing me to go as far as Burgos. We drove through in the gutted and blackened ruins of Arun and along the road to San Sebastian. We drew up at a Hotel Continental shortly after two. An excellent time for a drink before lunch according to Spanish hours. It took me a little time to accustom myself to the Spanish habit of lunching past two and dining at half past ten or later. But once I became used to them, I grew, up, I grew to prefer these hours to the English, indication perhaps of a slothful nature. After lunch with Vicuna's mother, a sweet white-haired old lady with whom I was unable to converse because of her ignorance of English and mind of Spanish, we continued our journey towards Victoria and Burgos. Unlike Arun, San Sebastian offered no damage from the war, the only signs of which, apart from the uniforms in the street, were slogans plastered on the walls, on houses and walls. The Alistos a la Falange, Arriba España, of the fascists, and the Carlist, Dios Patria y Rey, the last on a red and yellow background, the former on black and red. The red and yellow was the flag of Spain under monarchy, but the Republic had changed it to red, yellow, and purple. Black and red were the colors of the Falange, but also those of the FIA or the FAI, or anarchists, on the Republican side, which sometimes caused confusion in battle since flags were carried in action by both sides. These excuse me, these exhortations were interspersed interspersed with others on a more practical kind. Impidan sempre uh, domec, vinos y cornac domec, always order uh, domec's wine and brandy. Our last roads, or our roads led inland, rising gently at first among broken wooden hills with white, red-roofed homesteads dotted on the sides, then climbing and twisting steeply through the deep gorges amid thick forested mountains, until at length, shortly before Vittoria, we were on the Meseta, the flat Pluto, Pluto plateau of central Spain. At Dolosa, Via Franca, and Victoria were stopped by controls and made to show our passes. At Victoria, the control was manned by young uh, Riquetes of 15 or 16 years old, very self-important, but very smart in their red berets and khaki uniforms. <clears throat> During the journey, I told Vicuna of my true purpose in coming to Spain. His eyes lit up and he exclaimed, You will be very welcome with us, and I am sure we can arrange for you to join a fighting unit. In any case, I will introduce you to some friends of mine on the general staff when we get to Burgos. We reached Burgos at 7 and parked outside the Hotel Norte uh, y Londres. The hotel was full, and, but I found a room in a house nearby kept by two women. Like James Pig's, like James Pig's cupboard, it smelled strongly of cheese, but was clean and comfortable. 
Outside, the air was bitter and a breath of ice that went right through my overcoat and clothes, and I was glad to return to the warmth of the hotel. I stood in the lounge waiting for Vicuna to join me and watching the chattering crowd pass through the hall. There were women of all ages, most of them wearing some kind of medallion or badge attached to their dress by a red and yellow ribbon, and men in smart uniforms or in civilian clothes with red uh, rickety Kerry barrettes or blue phalange forge caps. A tall, broad-shouldered, fair-complexioned man of about 35 came up and introduced himself. May I join you? I can see your English. My name is Rupert Belleville. Have a drink. Belleville was already well known in England as an expert on Spain, an aficionado of bullfights and a bold amateur pilot flying his own aircraft. Fighting himself in the south of Spain at the outbreak of the Civil War, he had enlisted in the Falange unit and taken part in operations in Andalusia. Horrified and disgusted by the frequent spectacles of atrocities committed by some of the anarchists and communists in the villages and countryside of that backward region, he was less he was a little less shocked when he required himself to take part in firing squads to execute the criminals. Eventually, he left his unit. What, a, what had especially sickened him, apart from a natural revulsion at the shooting of prisoners, was that the victims went on twitching and writhing for some minutes after death, and he could never believe that they were really dead. Certainly, the execution of prisoners was one of the ugliest aspects of the Civil War, and both sides were guilty of it in the early months. There were two main reasons for this. First, the belief firmly held by each side that the others were traitors to their country, and enemies of humanity who fully deserved death. Secondly, the fear on each side that unless they exterminated their adversaries, these would rise again and destroy him. But it is a fact observed by me personally, that as the war developed, the nationalists tended more and more to spare their prisoners, except those of the international brigades, so that when in 1938 the Non-Intervention Commission began to arrange exchanges of prisoners of war, they found large numbers of Republicans held by the Nationalists, but scarcely any Nationalist soldiers in Republican prison camps. Belleville had attended the funeral of Calvo Sotelo, the, mar the monarchist statesman whose murder by Republican police was the signal for the outbreak of the Civil War five days later. There were about 8,000 people present. The government had forbidden the fascist salute, but on this occasion the feeling was so intense, although only a few were phalangists, everyone, nearly everyone was making their salute. Shock police, guardios, uh, guardias de asalto, posted in side streets on motorcycles, shot up everyone they saw saluting. Belleville estimated that there must have been several hundred, several hundred casualties. Now, I have my aerial plane here, he said, but I can't get permission to move nearer to the front. There's nothing at all at this place except wives and sweethearts sitting around on their bottoms and discussing the latest rumors. <clears throat> at that moment, we were joined by a dark-haired woman of about 35, with a quiet, grave manner, whom Belleville introduced to us as the Duquesa de Lesera. She greeted me with a smile of great charm. And what do you want to do in Spain? I want to fight, I answered, feeling rather embarrassed. She looked up and down me, coolly. That is very nice of you. I don't think you will find it difficult. She glided away. The Kuna arrived and Belleville left us. I did not see him again for some time. But one day in the following September, he sprang into prominence in the world's news. The Nationalists had launched their final assault on Santander, whose fall was expected hourly. Belleville had had his aerial plane in San Sebastian when a report came through that the town had surrendered. Resolved to be the first to welcome the victorious army, he and a Spanish friend of a similar temperament, Ricardo Gonzalez of the famous Sherry family, loaded his aircraft with crates of sherry and brandy took off from San Sebastian and soon afterwards landed on the airfield at Santander. A swarm of blue-clad soldiers surrounded the aircraft, and Belleville and Gonzalez climbed out with the shouts of Viva Franco! Arriba España! 
when they had realized the astonishment and dismay that these were Republican militiamen and that Santander was in enemy hands, they were uh, recessly marched to prison, transferred the Gijon and Astras, and just before the fall of Santander, and for a week or two, were in grave danger of summary, uh, summary execution. Fortunately, Gonzalez was able to pass as an Englishman, having been educated in England. He was released in order to arrange their exchange for two Republican p prisoners held by nationalists. Meanwhile, Belleville stayed in prison, encouraged from time to time by his captors with stories of what was going to happen to him should Gonzalez fail to organize the exchange satisfactorily. In the end, the nationalists handed over two senior officers of the Republican army, and he was released. Vicuna was uh, accompanied by a major and three captains from the commander, uh, the Comandancia Militar, one of whom spoke English. He was captain. Uh, he was captain at the Conde de Elda, and he wore, in addition to field boots and spurs, the broad blue and gold stash, sash of the general staff. After some curious and powerful cocktails of brandy and vermouth, we dined in a small crowded restaurant near the hotel, on river trout and the local Vin Rose, Elda said. The military situation of the Reds is very precarious. Any day now, Madrid will be in our hands. It was nearly two and a half years before his words came true. End of chapter one.